And now, from Pasadena, it's CCN Sunrise with Sunita Joshua Madison, Paulo Alejandria, the Crown City News team, and the CCN Sunrise segment stars. It's time to wake up San Gabriel Valley with CCN Sunrise. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for watching CCN Sunrise. We have a great show for you today. Sandy Roscoe from the San Gabriel Chamber of Commerce is here to talk about how the Chamber helps small businesses get started. I'm Sunita Joshua Madison. And I'm Paulo Alejandria. we got a great show. Our Money and Markets guru, Bob McClure, is here to talk to Stephen Lambert of the 2020 Network about jobs and poverty. It's going to be another great one. I can feel it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, you know, this weekend is we're getting started. Do you have any weekend plans? Um, nothing unusual, but I know you got a, you got quite a weekend ahead of you, I, right? I happen to have uh, something pretty fabulous. I'm yeah. going to the Grand Canyon. Yeah, and it's, this is not your first time, but you're going there with some first-timers, right? Yes, uh, two boys, the young one uh, taking my son and my dad, who really wanted, who was the one who was like, you got to take me to the Grand Canyon right. if I'm way out west here. Yeah. Um, so it's so exciting because I remember the first time I went to the Grand Canyon and we were like looking at the map like, are we there yet? Where is the Grand Canyon? We can't see. And then all of a sudden, like from the corner of your eye, you see it and you're just like, that's the Grand Canyon. Yeah. There's no missing that Holy. thing. I mean, it's an experience every time. Absolutely. I'm so. sure it's going to be great. But talking about things that are, well, let's talk about what's going on right here in the San Gabriel Valley. And now, CCN, Crown City News. Your news, your neighborhood starts right now. Pasadena is testing new devices to keep bicycles moving in the city. CCN's Tony Mead has more on that story. Hi everybody, I'm at Walnut Street in St. John Avenue in Pasadena, where the city of Pasadena is testing four different bike detecting devices to see which technology will work best to trigger and change traffic lights. In response to public requests for stronger, safer, more bicycle infrastructure, Pasadena's Department of Transportation is formally studying the cost, accuracy, maintenance, and potential impact of implementing the city's first protected bicycle lanes with bike detection for the 38 bicycle intersections in Pasadena. Department of Transportation engineer Joaquin Siquez says a new law in California will help keep bikes moving. The state passed a law that required um, detection of bicycles in vehicle travel lanes uh, to get additional green time as they go through the intersections. That way as you start up, if you come to a red light uh, and you start as a bicyclist through the intersection, you don't um, get trapped in the middle and then it goes yellow to red again. Since bicycles are small in size, they present their own unique set of challenges to traffic signal control and safety making traditional detection options difficult. Siquez explains the different detection technologies they are looking into. Uh, Econolite makes a product, Iteris makes a product, um, Census makes a product, and FLIR, F-L-I-R, is the four uh, technologies that were, four companies that we're looking at. Um, but Econolite has two different versions, one with a radar and video, and one that's a video by itself. Um, FLIR is a uh, thermal-based detection system that looks at the, the heat of the object. And then the census is a micro radar that's in the ground that uh, is a radar based technology, so it's not a video technology. The testing phase will go through August 1st, and the city will decide which device was the best. And that device will be used for future improvement projects. In Pasadena, Tony Mead, CCN. Here's a story from our media partner, Beacon Media News, about steps the city of Monrovia is taking to move homeless out of Library Park. Chief Jim Hunt says in the past 16 months, the Monrovia Police Department made 127 arrests involving the homeless, mostly for property theft and drug violations. He's putting together a five-point plan to tackle the problem, which includes outreach and education programs, direct giving to the Foothill Unity Center, relocating community programs to the park, a neighborhood watch, and a video surveillance option. He'll present these options during the first city council meeting in September. For more information about the story, visit crowncitynews.com or our media partner, beaconmedianews.com. Well, talking about the police and police departments and whatnot, there's some interesting news coming right here out of our own department right here in Pasadena. So apparently, uh, given, given the, the length of time these files are being held, the PPD can actually destroy files from old investigations on their officers which is kind of interesting in light of some of the things that's been happening recently with the department. I don't understand how the city council could vote this way. I mean, 
you know, there's no reason why those the, those files can't be archived. Well, from what I understand, uh, according to the chief, these are uh, this is information gathered on investigations related to more police conduct. You know, using foul language. Uh, you know, during traffic stops, you know, things that are obviously not officer-involved shootings or serious misconduct. Well, it's honestly, more like background information from past applicants. You know, so they say. You know, so and, they say, and now right? we need to take them at their word about this. I do understand that the files will be reviewed again before the official, um, you know, destruction. But it, it's still not right. There's at this point with you know clouds and all of that. There's no reason why that information can't be documented. Yeah, and, uh, and I mean, archived. a lot of people in the city feel the same way you do. Councilman John Kennedy says this information should be out there and be held for as long as possible, if if it has to be destroyed at all. And honestly, it just point. You know, when when the police department is working so hard to try to build trust in the community something like this just, it's a little curious it, it destroys that because you kind of wonder what are you hiding if, if those are the files that you need to destroy I mean, from what I it might be a, just just to clear out some backlog I mean there's a lot of people that apply there's a lot of investigations that happen internally I mean is this information even really still relevant 20 years on well that would say that you know when they're doing their police investigation that they should go ahead and and destroy um, you know, evidence and things like that because even in cold case files or, you know, other uh, investigations, sometimes, you know, 10, 20 years later, someone goes back to the archives and discovers how things right. now fit together. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I think under their own investigations, it doesn't make sense. Right. I mean, but there's some exciting stuff in the future of our, I mean, there's a, there's a tunnel that they're proposing for this $70 million billion dollar San Francisco to LA project high speed rail. And part of the deal is you're going to have a tunnel cutting across the San Gabriel Mountains, connecting Palmdale and Burbank. I pretty, think pretty neat, huh? I think it's exciting. You know, yeah. I am, uh, you know, all for the the rail and having a fast system. You know, we've we've traveled to Europe, and it's such an easy system to get around all over. There's no reason we shouldn't have that and have it be high speed. I mean, you know, these these trains, you know, can go up to 300 miles and per apparently hour. It's getting some support. Like Supervisor Antonovich thinks it's a great idea. So we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Well, speaking of the PPD, Sunita, somebody took a little field trip to the to the behind the scenes of how the PPD works. How did, how did that whole thing go? It's well, pretty interesting, it's, right? It's fascinating. I went there to talk to the dispatchers um, who were involved in the uh, Smith homicide and, uh, you know, the, the uh, standoff with police. And one of the interesting pieces that they told me is that the dispatcher mentioned that while she was on the phone with the suspect, he actually put down the phone and she heard shots fired. Yeah. That's that, got to be very eerie. Oh my gosh. I mean, just to imagine what was happening. Yeah. She couldn't see, but uh, I did get a chance to talk to them, and here's a look at that. Yeah, let's take a look. Hi everyone, we're here at the Pasadena Police Department behind the scenes at the dispatch where Diane Marin took a call from triple homicide suspect John Aziel Smith during a tragic standoff with police. Thanks for being here, Diane. So this was obviously an active um, situation where there was a lot of calls coming in from people reporting gunfire. What was it like for you when, when you heard him on the phone? I think that uh, you get a moment where you want to react to something and you can't and automatically your training comes in and you have to start asking this person questions that are going to be important to the officers in the field and helping keeping people safe. Were you hearing the officers on the other end? We have a radio system where I can hear what the officers are sort of saying and uh, the main dispatcher is across the way. I can hear her asking me questions and things like that. But um, no, when he initially called, he, he made that statement and then um, he, he made what statement? Well, he said that he killed someone. As you were hearing the conversation, is there uh, what kinds of things were you hearing in the background? Uh, it sounded like he set the phone down. It sounded like he um, he got a gun ready, and uh, he started shooting while I was on the line. You're seven months pregnant, correct? Yes. How hard is it for you? Because you know, stress isn't a good thing for you. Um, right. How do you manage that in a very extremely stressful situation? Well, um, I think that that's where the training comes into play and you focus in on the things that you're supposed to ask, you focus on the things that the officers need, that the dispatchers need in the room. And even though my baby was moving around a lot because of, you know, the high anxiety of that, you know, I just I had to keep a level head. 
Well, um, Diane Marin wasn't the only one involved in this. Obviously, the dispatch room was very active at that time, and we have uh, someone else who was involved in, in the whole uh, coordination of the resources. Uh, you're Alexis Bartoli. Yes. And what was your role in this? Um, I was the main dispatcher on the main frequency. Um, I was in charge of uh, making sure I knew where all the officers were and uh, where help was needed. Okay, and, and how does it work when, when a call comes into dispatch? What, what's uh, the process? Well, there's um, always call takers and a main dispatcher. Um, the call takers will take the calls, input the information, and send it to me electronically. Uh, based on what I get, um, it's in a uh, priority. So based on the priority, obviously this is a high priority, um, I look at the units that I have and I broadcast the call and get units started there. Um, we also make sure that, you know, the fire department is notified, especially in something like this. Um, and I just keep track of where my officers are, um, how many are going, how many are needed, and um, make sure that I relay any information that um, is coming in from the phone call to them. Um, how difficult is it for you both to interact in this active situation? Um, I think we would both agree that the call takers are critical to what I was doing and and based on what the officers needed, I relayed that back to the call takers. So the teamwork is, you can't do without it in a job like this. I want to thank you both for your service in uh, keeping calm in this situation. Um, I know there's not a dull day, but nobody wants situations like this in our community. And we just want to thank you for both for staying calm and your courage in this. Um, John Aziel Smith is scheduled to be arraigned on August 7th in LA County District. Your local Chamber of Commerce is a great resource if you're looking to start a small business. Sandy Roscoe from the San Gabriel Chamber of Commerce is here to tell us how she can help. Next. So, I got this new family. And I don't know what it is about this one, but she can't seem to put down that toy all day long. Tap, 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 tap. Oh, and she even talks to it. She talks to that more than she talks to him. What's up, bro? Nice shirt. Who's she talking to? Her mom? She talks to her mom a lot. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. And now, CCN Brown City News. Your news, your neighborhood starts right now. Sandy Roscoe from the San Gabriel Chamber of Commerce is here to tell us more on what they can do to help. Hey you, how's it going? <laughs> it's going fantastically well. Thank you so much for having me this morning. A pleasure to have you. We are very, very proud of our city and what we can do for businesses and how we can help. So for, for a lot of us who might not know, I mean, what role exactly does the Chamber of Commerce play in somebody who has designs on having a small business? Your potential entrepreneur, how does it benefit them as well? Well, we like, hopefully our goal is to have businesses come to us when they first start, maybe even before they start, because ideally we like to help them from the ground up. We like them to come with, to us and say, I have a business plan and a dream. And that way we can connect them with people that can help them with their business plan to say, 
this is not the best business plan, or these are some areas you can improve, help them with capital, then take them to the city hall and help them from the beginning. How do I get a permit? How do I make sure I'm going to line up with everything the city would ask? So we keep them out of trouble before they get into trouble. It's basically like a smart. guide. It's yes. Guide. Now, what if people don't even have the business plan? What if they're not there? Do you help them with that yeah, as well? Yes, we can. So they come to me and they say, Sandy, I just have an idea for a restaurant and I don't even know how to do this. Then we have amazing chamber members that can help them with their business plan. We don't, um, we don't recommend one over another. We love our, all of our members, so I would say here's a list of our members that could help you with your business plan. You see who would match up with you. And then we can connect them with banks. We have a, a number of banks in our chamber, not only uh, mainstream like Wells Fargo and Union Bank, but also independent banks. We're really proud of our independent banks. And sometimes they, our independent banks can offer funding where a mainstream would not. Then we can take them to the city and say, how do we help you with your business license and your permits and everything from the ground up? And what if they run into challenges? Because that's, you know, the permit process is so difficult. What if they run into challenges? Is there ways you can help them yes. with those? So I have one right now. I have a business right now that is having, they, don't, they have a neighbor that doesn't know about the good neighbor policy. They didn't go to the Fred Rogers School of Being a Good Neighbor. <laughs> so she called and she said, what do I do? So we're trying to help her, but also going to the city with her and saying, okay, this is her business, and yes, maybe she changed her business during the course of once she got the permit, but we don't want her to leave San Gabriel. We want her to stay here, so how can we work with her? And our city is really working hard to become more business friendly and to streamline the process and to give someone a project manager from the time they walk in. Yeah, so what are some of the challenges of, of doing businesses, business in San Gabriel? Well, some of our strengths are also our weaknesses mm -hmm. because it is a small city. It is 4.6 square miles, although it's strong, it's very strong. But one of the things we love is our diversity, our cultural diversity. And, and some, it's just a small space too. Yes, yeah. and some people see that as a challenge because there's this misconception that it's all Asian. And we're so excited about our Asian community, but it's not all Asian. There's every possible culture so represented. There's a perceived boundary because yes. of the differences, like yes. not just language, but culturally as yes. well. Yes. But so are there like cultural exchanges or information? Because, you know, um, I, I know in the Asian community there, there are, you know, kind of practices for businesses. Um, is there a way to like kind of demystify those things? Yes. What we're doing is we really working hard at the chamber to draw every type of business in. Whether they join the chamber or not is okay but come to our events, come to our things, because as they get to know one another, mystery goes out, but also what happens is you begin to build relationships and you do business with someone with whom you have a relationship. I have a relationship with Crown City News. Mm. There's nothing I wouldn't do for uh, them. Uh, that did not start because right they walked in the door. They didn't walk in the door and say, here's my membership check. They yeah. didn't do that. We just start building a relationship. Now, oh, I, I'm sorry to cut mm -hmm. you off, but no. I did want to ask you, Sandy. So, I mean, obviously all the functions of the chamber are important, but would you say that perhaps the most important function of the chamber is putting business together to network? Yes, and we have strong, strong networking events. You've come to some, yeah. Tammy's come to some, and we don't, you don't have to be a member of our chamber to come to anything we do. And we have businesses in every city around, from Burbank to Irwindale to Colton. There's no city that we don't touch because we don't really have good boundaries. I'm not a boundary person. And so we mm -hmm. have businesses from everywhere, and you don't have to be a member of the chamber to come to our things. So you might be looking for someone that is a tutor, you come to our events and I hook you up with someone that does that. You say, you know, I'm looking, I need a business consultant. You come to our networking events, you're gonna meet that person. We had an amazing networking breakfast last Friday morning, 130 people, it's complimentary, 130 people came and they were doing amazing networking. Mm -hmm. Exchanging cards, the yes. whole line. And not just exchanging cards, we encourage you to get together afterwards. So before you leave here, did you make a, uh, an appointment to go have coffee? Okay. Did you say, I want to come see your business? So it's being proactive in the chamber. You can't just proactive. you know come and sit in the corner and, no. and view. I mean, it's all no. about getting out there and collaborating. Yes. And we keep involved with you. So once you come to something once, you're part of us. You know, it doesn't matter if you didn't join the chamber. Once you've come once, you are part of us from then on. And we like that. Yeah, we, we do. We certainly do. Once you're connected, there's no hiding. Well, there is no hiding. Ask, <laughs> ask them. Ask Paul and ask Tammy. They came one time. That's it. You are part of us forever. 
and we make sure that we refer to you. We make sure that we stay connected with you. We will stop in and see you just to say, how's your business going? Well, we love being part of the family, so thank you, <laughs> you for are coming part in of our today. family. Thank you. And uh, sharing some of the things that the Chamber does for businesses we and, appreciate and the help it. you give. Thank you so much for this All opportunity. Right. Always a pleasure seeing you. Thank you. Right. Well, we'll be back with more on the economy. People are getting back to work, but... Still not getting out of poverty. Bob McClure will tell us more on his money and market segment coming right up. Hart, what's going on? I'm leaving. Why? What did I do? Not enough. You constantly ignore me. You barely eat anything healthy. You're half as active as you used to be. The pressure is just too much. I quit. Okay, I get it. I'll do better. Just please, don't leave. Okay. But remember, if I go, you go. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. Cook foods to the right temperature using a food thermometer. 3,000 Americans will die from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. In the small town of Elmira, New York, a boy was born into an all-American family. The odds of him opening his own clothing store at the age of 18? One in 138,000. Excited to be a part of pop culture, he packed for the big city. The odds of finding someone to invest in his vision? One in 4.5 million. The odds of him achieving his dream in the fashion industry? One in 23 million. The odds of having a child diagnosed with autism? One. In 68. I am Tommy Hilfiger, and my family is affected by autism. Learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Early diagnosis can make a lifetime of difference. It's been 50 years since Lyndon Johnson declared a war on poverty. Unemployment's down, but are the available jobs enough to lift people out of poverty? For his Money in Markets segment, Bob McClure talks to Steve Lambert from the 2020 Network on job creation and poverty. Yeah, this is the 50th anniversary of Lyndon Johnson declaring the war on poverty, and the Southern California Association of Governments is commemorating the event with a summit on the 20th of August. Here to talk with us today about that summit is Steve Lambert of the 2020 Network. Hey, Bob. Thank you for, for having me here. Glad you could make it. Uh, there was a roundtable discussion on Wednesday this week, and a number of issues were put on the table. <clears throat> the most striking to me was the incredibly close connection between level of education and poverty. Oh, and that, that is the magic bullet in all of this. If, if we can fix that, um, we can begin to fix the, the job problem and the poverty problem. If you look at various counties in Southern California, those with the lowest level of educational attainment, in other words, those where kids don't graduate high school or barely get by high school will have the highest poverty levels. And it's interesting because those numbers don't simply translate to them as they become adults, but translate to their children and, and subsequent generations. Now this seems to be something that requires cooperation between many different agencies. There's not just one agency, one group that can, can uh, attack the problem. What, what are you seeing happening out well, there? Well, that's, that's absolutely right. I think historically we have tried to attack this in silos. Schools do their thing, businesses do their thing, government does whatever government does, but the three of them never work together. Uh, and then you throw in nonprofits that do their thing, and you put them all together in a room and there's a great opportunity to start modeling programs. For example, can businesses and schools create partnerships that, 
that create sort of old school vocational training, mm -hmm. the thing that we got rid of 20, 30 years ago. Right, right. Uh, another thing that I took away from that meeting was the, the prevalence of transportation issues in contributing to poverty. Can you speak of that briefly? Uh, totally. You live in a community, the, the nearest job that you can fill is 15 miles away. How are you going to get there if you don't have the means to get there? And that's why projects like the Gold Line Foothill Extension through our area right here is so important. It's, it's not just a means of getting people from one place to another, but it's a great opportunity to become, and pardon the metaphor, an economic engine for the entire region. And right now there's talk going on about how, you know, how can we bring together educational institutions, all the colleges and universities, the Caltechs and so on, to create a tech corridor around that area right. that, that unites workers with jobs, with technology, and uplifts the entire area. Uh, another thing I took away from, from that uh, discussion on Wednesday was the, the, the fact that this is not an isolated instance. In, we have 25% of children in the area growing up in poverty, but that's not solely a problem limited to them. They're the haves and the have-nots, but they're very closely linked. They're, they're tied together with this, this issue. Sure. You know, one of the great political opportunities in this whole discussion is, you know, historically poverty has been, been a Democratic Party type issue. But if you look at it realistically, the greater the poverty level, the greater the cost on the rest of society. That becomes more of a Republican Party type issue. So you can attack it from all sides. Um, the haves in many ways have more to lose from all of this than the have-nots. The have-nots have already lost. Right. Uh, and I would assume that the have-nots, if, if, if they're productive and they're working, they're, they become consumers, they become taxpayers, they become contributors to society in, in every possible way. Right. And the key there is to create a bridge between the have-nots and the, and the haves. You know, in the past we had something called a middle class. We don't have that anymore in this country. And so how do we create that? Because right now, the, the people at the low end of the spectrum really have nothing to aspire to. Where are they going to go? You know, are you going to go from poverty to being a bank executive? Probably not. So we need to, to fortify that middle class. Yeah, and, and there seems to be a, a little bit of a, a, uh, a concern in the area of low-income housing, right. where we, have, we build low-income housing and we, we go into that project with all of the best intentions, but often people who go into low-income housing just stay there. They're warehoused. And, and you know, that's why many people in the community don't want low-income housing in their, in their neighborhoods. The reality is there's huge demand for low-income housing. So if you can align that with social services that, that allow people to move out of dependency into self-sufficiency so that their, their goal isn't to stay in affordable housing the rest of their lives, their, their goal is to move on and buy a home, so on. The Habitat for Humanity model. Okay. Um, as we get to the end here, I know that there is a summit coming up on August 20th. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, it's going to bring together stakeholders from throughout the area, six county area. Um, it's going to be educators, government leaders, business leaders. It's going to be held at the Exposition Center in LA, August 20th, all day. Uh, you can get more information at, at www.scag.ca.gov. Okay. Steve, thank you for your thank time you. this morning. Appreciate, Appreciate it, Bob. being here. Thanks. All right. Well, that's definitely a fight worth having. Well, speaking of another fight, we're all trying to fight those tiny lines on our face. But Mary Winter says it's time to stop fighting and embrace our wrinkles. Amen, sister, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Sing it. In her, in her senior, senior solutions segment coming up next. You know what, guys? There's a lot of tree branches and dry brush over here. We should probably move the bonfire over there. I'm guessing Smokey liked that idea.
There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. Hey, everybody. Heart disease affects one in every three women in America, but you can fight back. There's no time to lose. Mothers, sisters, daughters, families, and friends, it's time to shout louder, stand stronger, and demand change. Let's go. To the Batmobile. Dang it. To the invisible jet. Dang it. Together, we can put an end to heart disease. It's time to go red for women. I could use your help. Yeah! Learn more from the American Heart Association at www.goredforwomen.org. Separate raw meats from other foods by using different cutting boards. 3,000 Americans will die from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. Well, see, I guess it depends on who you ask, but I would say the only wrinkles you and I have to worry about are the ones on our shirt, right? Oh, boy, Paul, I don't know, you know, especially being on TV, it's a little rough, yeah, you know? Yeah, it makes All you a little self-conscious, right? I used to be right? like, oh, no, I don't worry about wrinkles, and I'm like, what are these things on my forehead? Please. But, you know, Mary Winters is here to tell us in her senior segment that we need to stop the battle and embrace our wrinkles. Well, Mary, we're not all, you know, fighting the good fight like you are. I mean, you look fabulous. Well, so thank you for here, saying here. that. But still, I mean, I think really we want to just at least look better than our age, correct? Right. So do you do you defy the wrinkles, or do we do we embrace the wrinkles? Embrace. And honestly, wrinkles should be a badge of honor as we age. Instead, as Americans, we throw billions of dollars a year into ironing those wrinkles out. There are so many celebrities now who are stating that they are absolutely opposed to doing any kind of Botox or any kind of, any kind of treatment that would defy or change the way they would naturally age. Some of those people are Bridget Bordeaux, Catherine Deneuve, uh, we have Judy Dench, and how about that fabulous picture of Helen Mirren on the beach in her bikini? You go, girl. So really what happens as we age, skin is our largest organ. We start to reduce, as women, reduce in estrogen levels, as well as our collagen, which kind of keeps our skin firm, that starts to drop as well, and the oil changes in our skin. So what can we do to age successfully? Well, wh what we want to do is just avoid the sun. It's kind of the no-brainers of aging, period. Eat well, um, eat, a, eat a good diet, hydrate, make sure you're avoiding the sun, by putting um, sunscreen on your, on your skin, wearing the hat. Um, also, just make sure that you're getting plenty of sleep as well. So as far as I'm concerned, your takeaway today is embrace the wrinkle and let your radiance and self-confidence shine through those deserved smile lines. It shows that you've been living a happy life. I think that is the biggest key. I mean, so many people are like, oh, I don't want to get older and, uh, and you know, I want to stay in the 20s. But honestly, even for me, I'm like, I did the 20s. I'm done with it. I don't understand why I would want to keep going back there. So, you know. And there's a beauty to aging gracefully. I mean, I've always thought really? as well. Really? Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing, too, is things like smoking. That, that really can contribute to the, developing the lines and other health issues. But absolutely, just, just age gracefully. Embrace just it. Just like Show you. Thanks for those, Mary. Thank you. Well, in our next half hour, Lee Queer is here to tell us how home warranties can help take the anxiety out of home ownership. And we'll be talking to Melanie Goodyear of the Jericho Road Pasadena Foundation when we come back. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. Everybody has a dream.
mine was to see the ocean. And with a little help, I made it. Sale más barato Podrás comprarme golosinas y mimarme Todo el rato Inscríbete. El seguro médico a tu alcance ya está aquí Inscríbete por los que se preocupan por ti A full life measured in seats starts with the right ones early on. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Learn how to prevent deaths and injuries by using the right car seat for your child's age and size. And now, from Pasadena, it's CCN Sunrise with Sunita Joshua Madison, Paulo Alejandria, the Crown City News team and the CCN Sunrise segment stars. It's time to wake up San Gabriel Valley with CCN Sunrise. We're back with our second half hour of CCN Sunrise. Thanks to us for sticking around. I'm Sunita Joshua Madison. And I'm Paulo Alejandria. One half hour down, another one to go, right, partner? We can do this. <laughs> We're going to do it. Hey, this, so there was this big thing during the week, that big water main that, that busted over by UCLA. Pretty crazy stuff, huh? Oh, my gosh. It, like, flooded parking garages. People were stuck. Oh, Poly my Pavilion was just drowned. Poly Pavilion in UCLA. I mean, just some crazy stuff. And to happen, like... The worst time ever like with the during drought. drought. I know. I mean, to think of all that water just wasted. But also, I mean, just you know, like trying to avert that. Did you get stuck in it at all? I mean, I I I, I missed it by an hour. I was oh in the neighborhood. I was by UCLA, in fact, but I missed it by an hour. I'm driving home, listening to the news radio. Water main busted. I'm like, wow. Got to get out of here. Stars. Thank my lucky stars. I missed that. Well, that's good. And now we're going to take a quick look at some of the news headlines happening right here in the San Gabriel Valley. And now, CCN, Crown City News. Your news, your neighborhood starts right now. Despite being told he'd have a 50-50 chance of surviving after a brain aneurysm, teenager Andrew Penrubia is doing all the things his classmates are doing with just one arm. CCN's Tony Mead has this moving story. Born at great risk, this miracle kid bounces back with the power of prayer. Andrew Pinarubia's family says it's a miracle that he's playing instruments. <laughs> at age seven, Andrew found out he had a condition called arterial venous malformation, or AVM, that made his blood vessels weak. I um, went to an amusement park, and I, once I came back, having a blast, um, all of a sudden I suffered an aneurysm, uh, a brain aneurysm, and that uh, paralyzed my whole left side. He was having these symptoms, uh, screaming for head, headache, um, and then he started vomiting too. And then after starting vomiting, he said that he's, he's losing his vision. Andrew's father says he remembers that horrible day. But the weeks and months after were the hardest days of all. Andrew was in a coma for two weeks and given a 50-50 chance of surviving. At one point, the doctor said he was dying. Then all of a sudden, we, we got the, this phone call from my sister-in-law from Pasadena and said, hurry up, you better come here because Andrew's sick. But they didn't tell us what's going on, that he was dying already. Vanji and the family turned to God and friends. Soon, people all over the world were praying for Andrew to recover. The pastor prayed with me, and then, you know, the pastor called everyone in the church, all the members, and the members of our church called every single person they know that, that, that can pray. And so this prayer chain became global. Family members say God answered their prayers with a miracle. 
Now 18 years old, Andrew has overcome many obstacles in life. He had to learn to walk, talk, and use his arms all over again. Since then, he's been voted prom king. He plays musical instruments with one hand. Somewhere over the rainbow. And he's won many awards of achievement and has won a three-point shooting competition. I've seen so many miracles in other people's lives, in our family's lives, you know. That's why I believe in prayer. I learned how to adapt to my disability, and it's not really a disability, I think. Uh, uh, it, it's like more of a blessing. The story of Andrew can make you believe that anything is possible. In Pasadena, Tony Mead, CCN. They're coming from Thailand and Japan to see the spicy red rooster. CCN's Andy Rocco tells us about how you can tour the Sriracha factory in Irwindale. I'm at the Sriracha factory in Irwindale where Sriracha is giving one of the hottest tours in town. I am a lover of hot sauce ever since I was a little girl. The only one in the family. I always liked it. Now that the fuss between Sriracha and the city of Irwindale about chili odor complaints is over, fans can now enjoy a tour of the hot sauce factory. The Sriracha Factory has been offering tours since February, but in August, the tour will be much more enticing because it's the start of pepper grinding season. The tour was more than I expected. It was a lot of fun. The, uh, the person who gave the tour did a fantastic job, very informative, uh, very interesting. We learned a lot and it was a lot of fun. Visitors on this tour had the chance to meet David Tran, the man who started it all. My favorite part was meeting David. Yes, yes. I he, think it was a very lucky day for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I talked to him in Cantonese and I said, you must stay in California. As for the smell of peppers, many of the visitors said it was minimal. Didn't smell anything. No, even, even when we were around the crushing of the, of the peppers, nothing. Since opening its doors in February, Sriracha Factory has seen more than 1,200 visitors. In Irwindale, Andy Rocco, CCN Sunrise. And we're back for the morning buzz. Uh, Paolo, the biggest buzz going on right now is in Congress with the GOP voting to sue Obama. Um, and never before to, to in history have you seen a legislative branch outright sue a member of the executive branch, much less the president. Absolutely, and you know, they've already voted a number of times on Obamacare and trying to uh, turn it over. At this point, you know, you just start wondering what is, is going to be accomplished here. I know that they're saying, you know, the GOP side is saying that they're trying to, you know, just uh, go for constitutional rights and things like that, but I, I don't understand yeah. what's going to be No matter how you cut it, how you interpret what's being done by the GOP, um, it is an interesting view of our checks and balances, which is supposed to be the root of our democratic system, this, this perceived checks and balances. Here you see it highlighted, like, it's right there, it's in your face. Why it's done, I don't know. There's, there's people who would think, okay, it's a political stunt by the GOP. You ask Speaker Boehner, he's defending the Constitution. So either way you cut it, it it's unprecedented and that's why it should be taken note because this, here you see them directly at odds with each other, making no bones about it. Well, and uh, uh, you know, honestly, usually they did more trade-offs for something like this. I mean, w the healthcare law is there at this point. Right. Why not work to make it better? I mean, there are things that you know, small little provisions. If they just added a line or a sentence, it would it would flow and more. And it sounds smoothly. so easy to people like you and me, but I think when you get to these little channels through the government, and maybe it, you 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 get you 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 hit a lot of. Uh, obstacles, so to speak, and Absolutely. that's the political and, process. And, you know, they're saying that it's a failure on Obama's part to enforce um, the penalty that would uh, penalize small business or businesses, basically, yeah. for um, not offering basic health care. Basic health care, yeah. Um, but again, you know, there are other ways that we need to work together to make this happen, and it's just not happening. Yeah. And it's really a failure of, of the full government. It's right. on both sides. Yeah, both sides are accountable. It's uh, it's either way. It's going to be interesting to see what's what's going to come with this. But we got some national news. Uh, Ray Rice uh, made this apology. Apology. Uh, uh, 
official. Apology okay. for okay. not doing so anything, right? So we can all right? agree, we can all agree that what we saw in February, the, the footage of him in Atlantic City with his now wife, horrendous, obviously. But I think what the, the the main issue here is how the NFL is handling the situation. Now there have been penalties dealt out to players for offenses such as drug offenses. I think the NFL is undergoing a lot of criticism right now because they a lot of people feel that the penalty handed down to Ray Rice did not fit the crime. It was a little too, like a slap on the wrist. Absolutely, but the, honestly, the thing that adds to the confusion is the fact that they are married now, and, right. and she's not, you know, she's not going uh, after him on this. Yeah. So. I mean, but that's their, their their whole thing. I think what people are looking at is how the the NFL. Here's a chance. You know, people look at you as a primitive sort of sport. Here's a chance to maybe win that audience, but. A lot of people think they fumbled there. They did, and, and there's Part players the coming around saying they're fumbling. Yeah. So. All right. Well, if you've given up plans to invest in real estate in California, you're not alone. Lee Cuellar gives you tips on looking outside the state to buy income property. Actually, his segment is going to be on how home warranties can help homeowners feel less anxiety. We'll be back with more. Heart disease affects one in every three women in America, but you can fight back. There's no time to lose. Mothers, sisters, daughters, families, and friends, it's time to shout louder, stand stronger, and demand change. Let's go! To the Batmobile. Dang it. To the invisible jet. Dang it. Together, we can put an end to heart disease. It's time to go red for women. I could use your help. Yeah! Learn more from the American Heart Association at www.goredforwomen.org. Separate raw meats from other foods by using different cutting boards. 3,000 Americans will die from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. all Smokey wants for his 70th birthday. Becoming a new homeowner can fill anyone with anxiety. A home warranty can take away some of your worries. Lee Coyar is here to tell us how they work in his Your Home segment. So today we're going to talk about the wonderful, wacky world of home warranty. So you've just bought a house. The best, least expensive investment you can make is to get a home warranty that will protect that house. Now, a home warranty is going to protect the systems in that house, your heating, your air conditioning, plumbing, electrical, and sometimes swimming pools and appliances. So let's say you're in your house, it's been about a month, everything is fantastic. You wake up one morning, you go to the kitchen, you use your garbage disposal, you turn, on, you turn it on and it makes that horrible noise and then it stops. What do you do? You call your home warranty's toll-free number, they come out and diagnose the situation, the problem. The technician may tell you, I'm sorry, we're going to have to replace your garbage disposal. Now, what's that cost you? $75. Let's say you don't have a home warranty. You call the plumber out. He says, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to replace your garbage disposal. It's going to cost you $350. The first year in my house, I had over $15,000 in warranty work done. I got a new water heater, I got a new swimming pool uh, filter, and I don't, know why, I don't want to even tell you how many plumbing issues we had. So, do yourself a favor, get and keep that home warranty to protect your home. It'll cost you about $500 a year, and it's the best insurance policy you'll ever buy because you get to use it. Paulo and Sanita, back to you. 
Lee, I've got a call into home warranty in right now. In fact, every single one of our bathrooms has leaked. Mm -hmm. So the home warranty has been the best purchase we've made. So yeah, it takes a lot of anxiety out for sure. It, it really does. You know, uh, make that phone call, have patience with the technicians. It is an insurance endeavor. So, you know, have patience with those people on the telephone number. Sometimes it might take a little bit of, uh, of a push to get what you need but they will take good care of you and there are plenty of uh, reliable home warranty companies out there that you can deal with. Absolutely, right. thanks for those tips, Lee. Well, volunteering just isn't for kids anymore. Nonprofits can use your professional skills to make the community better. Find out how when Melanie Goodyear from Jericho Road, Pasadena joins us next. Maybe he's really focused. Hey, Michael. Michael. Maybe he likes spinning the wheels. Maybe he just loves trucks. Maybe he's just being a boy. Preoccupation with objects is one early sign of autism. Learn the others today. The sooner it's diagnosed, the better. If you drive buzzed, it could cost you around $10,000. You'll face major legal fees, major fines, and steep insurance penalties. You could lose everything. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Hey, Hard, what's this? That's my resignation letter. You're resigning. Why? Because you're constantly ignoring me. You're half as active as you used to be, and you eat stuff like this. You've been putting me under a lot of pressure lately. That's why I'm ready to quit. I, I forgot. I'll, I'll do better. Please, don't quit on me. OK, but remember, it's not what you say. It's what you do. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Let's go for a walk. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. Your professional expertise can make all the difference in a, for a nonprofit serving the community. Melanie Goodyear, Site Director from Jericho Road, Pasadena, will tell you how your skills could make all the difference to someone struggling. Thanks for being here, Melanie. Good morning. Good morning. So what is Jericho Road? Let's get into it. So essentially what we do is help uh, nonprofits be good nonprofits. Uh, most nonprofits are so busy feeding hungry people, rescuing puppies, doing their good work, um, that oftentimes they don't have good business operations. They might lack uh, financial infrastructure, technology, uh, board development, those kinds of things. So, so is oversight a correct word to use in describing uh, so your, more, your, your um, organization's More function? operations. So we support the good nonprofit operations uh, for local organizations. Um, and we do that by finding skilled volunteers. So if a nonprofit needs to manage their data better, we would go out and find a database architect and build them a good database. If they need a better board of directors, we would help them figure out what their board of directors should be doing. They need a marketing plan. Th those kinds of business aspects that lots of times nonprofits are so busy doing their work um, that they aren't is great on the, that operational and business so side. So you kind of work in partnership with nonprofits. Absolutely, to, absolutely. Yeah, to, We're, as yeah. one of my friends jokes, she says that I'm like eHarmony for volunteers. Oh my God. So I like skilled <laughs> volunteers that nonprofits need, match them up and get them doing. Do you really have any marriages to report? So, uh -huh. Yeah, most of our projects go really well. Um, so we've helped with everything from website creation to, as I said, board development, to getting nonprofits to have good budgets and financial practices, um, things that a lot of for-profit businesses do because they have to. Um, but again, in nonprofits, we're just often so focused on our work um, that we don't pay as much attention to that business side as we could. So you're getting uh, professionals to volunteer Absolutely. their yep. expertise. Yep. Now, I was just, you know, someone on Facebook, on my Facebook book feed, she is a professional, and she put out there, you know what, I'm tired of giving my free services away. I've done mm -hmm. it for so long. Why can't people expect to pay me for my good work? Are you hearing that, or what yeah, kind of... Uh, no, on from the people? contrary. I, there certainly are times when we have to pay for services, of course, but I think particularly where we're looking at a huge number of baby boomers with 40 or 50 years of professional experience retiring, they want to be giving back, and they want to be using the skills that they have used in their 
professions, they now want to give those back. I mean, um, on the flip so. side of that, have you seen volunteers kind of move on to that next phase in their professional career because of their work with Jericho Road? Yeah, absolutely. Most of our volunteers are people who already have a really strong, solid background, um, but we definitely have some like millennials who are gaining professional experience as well. Uh, so it's great for the younger folks um, and, and especially those baby boomers, especially the people who are anxious about retiring and thinking, oh my gosh, I've worked 80 hours a week for 40 years. What do I do now? You can put all those skills so, but you're seeing that all too, across the so. board as far as like the Absolutely. age range. You're seeing the millennials, Absolutely. but then you're seeing people who've already retired. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and the millennials, I mean, obviously a lot of them are struggling to find jobs and this might be their kind of, you know, transition. Uh, you know, they start out as volunteering intern. They do a mm -hmm. good job, might be hired on. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Or again, just having something to fill the resume. And we have a few yeah, and um, that millennials. doesn't hurt. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. And we have a few millennials that are, you know, kind of waiting tables and that kind of thing. So what they have on their resume that's professional is their volunteer experience provides references um, fills out their portfolio that wow kind of interesting thing. So that is just yeah. that, that is a really great way to, to, to pad up your resume especially mm -hmm. like you said if you're doing a job like waiting tables mm -hmm. or whatnot yeah, you, you're, you're filled up during the week right. you've got right. your volunteer right. work that you can that you can put up there yeah, so much yeah. More yeah. Definitely. But now what about some organizations you know nonprofits you know are always working with less resources than they really need I most, most of them yeah. right. 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 Um, and some just aren't even organized enough to use volunteers effectively how do you help them with that? Yeah, so part of my job is to really go in and do a needs assessment to help the nonprofits identify what things are going to help them build their capacity the most. Um, and we really work with some of the very small, no budget nonprofits that are all volunteer up to some of the multi million dollar organizations locally. Um, so there are some best business practices, and we just try to figure out how to translate those to the different needs of those different organizations. But that's part of my job to figure that out with the nonprofits. Well, personally, what I found with my own volunteer experience, I mean, you could come in there with a certain skill set, but then you could also pick up skill sets that will serve you right and, yeah and right. that's a benefit maybe not a lot of people not a lot of volunteers consider yeah yeah that's true skilled volunteerism I think is a little bit different and we're seeing uh, a real uh, rise in the amount of people that are doing skilled okay. volunteerism we have a very specific process we actually set up a scope of work for all of our volunteers so that it is almost like a pro bono consulting contract right. they know exactly what they're gonna do how long they're gonna take to do it um, so most of our volunteers are working within and their we skill set yes. so, it is a national organization yeah yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, we now have six affiliates across the country, um, but there are a number of other organizations that are also really helping, especially, again, those baby boomers who are retiring and want to use their skills. How do you do that substantively? How do you find the right match? And not for your just busy set? work. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and uh, speaking about your national organization, Jericho Road, where does that come from? So, it's a reference to a Martin Luther King speech. So, he was referring to the story of the Good Samaritan right. on the road to Jericho, um, and he said that we, we need to do more than wait until we see the problem right in front of us. We need to be really proactive. So we think that by having uh, skilled professionals go in and really make long-term changes to how nonprofits operate, those nonprofits are going to do better work for years and years to come. So we hope it's a really substantive way to give skills and give back to the community, plus a lot of fun. And how can people get involved with you? And you know, is there a screening process? That you can there is. So we are looking for a variety of skilled professionals. Um, our website is jrpasadena.org. So people are welcome to go on to that. Um, our local Local affiliate clearly serves local nonprofits, um, but we actually have volunteers from India and Australia and virtual volunteers that oh do. Oh my gosh, yeah. that, I didn't even think yeah, of that. Yeah, That's amazing. Yeah, because if you're a web developer, you can do that from India. Absolutely. Right. From here, well, so. thank you. Yeah. That is uh, thank great you. information to have, and uh, you're doing great work in the community. Great. Thank you so much. Thank right. Thanks. Thank you. Well, that is it for our show, and we'd like to thank our sponsors, Southern California Edison, EH Financial, Senior Providers Network, Pasadena Federal Credit Union, San Gabriel Valley Economic Partnership, Beacon Media News, Foothill Transit, and Ability First for sponsoring our show. We'd also like to thank our guest, Sandy Roscoe from the San Gabriel Valley, uh, San Gabriel Chamber of Commerce, and Melanie Goodyear from uh, Jericho Road, Pasadena. And thanks to all the CCN Sunrise crew and you, the viewers. See you next week.